The Thief and the Light It was a bright summer's day, not a cloud in the sky and the ocean crashed gently onto the pebbled shore. Javier sat there for a while breathing in the pure sea air, while the oceanic birds bellowed out their existence above him as they soared high into the sky. He had arrived early and the exhibition was not quite open. He was dressed in blue jeans, grey-green sneakers and a baggy t-shirt with a logo on the front of it declaring that he was an illegal alien. He sat there for a while totally mesmerized in the moment and then he took one final intake of breath, stood up and made his way to the promenade so he could be the first in the queue. He stood at the door of the tent just in the nick of time for the eager crowd gathered behind him in what seemed nothing other than a micron. Above the entrance of the tent was written in large lettering, UFO Convention. He paid the toll and made his way into the tent. His gaze shifted as he scanned the perimeter, until he spotted the artifact on a table at the far right of the tent. He had to appear inconspicuous, so he stood and looked at the photos in the picture gallery for a spell whilst the hungry crowd spilled enthusiastically into the tent. The pictures were supposed to be genuine snapshots of UFOs and impressions left on the landscape of where UFOs had left their mark. He suppressed his emotion at all the trouble that the artists had gone to in creating their genuine fakes. His pretend concentration was shattered as a budding UFO enthusiast blurted out over his shoulder, awesome. Do you not think? Exceptional, he lied. He stood there for a little longer, and he made some comments to some fellow enthusiasts, so he could appear to meld and mingle into the euphoric crowd. Then he made his way to the next photo gallery, this one was not alien crafts or marks on the landscape, it was messages and or signs left in the crops. There were many theories of why and how these signs had manifested, however, not one UFO buff in the now large crowd were interested in the others. They did not think that they were phony or practical jokes and mini whirlwinds and lightning balls were ridiculous for they were just too meticulous. Also some matched even though they appeared at different places and different times throughout their large planet. They did not believe in earth magic. They were part of the Neotech age. These were signs from the aliens. They were messages from far distant galaxies, and when the code was cracked that was when the aliens would arrive in peace and intergalactic cultural unification. The codes, it was suggested, were in the form of a musical scale, and all they had to do was to decipher their messages, and then the scientists could converse and pave the way for the intergalactic age. He made his way to the next table, but before he did he scanned the room once more to see if the chaotic crowd cloaked his movements. Not quite, if he made his move now he would be seen, of this he was certain. So, he moved on to the next gallery. This gallery had a display of all the paraphernalia that goes with abductions. There was a billboard and on it was an array of newspaper cuttings and literature. They were pinned under a specific heading, true or false, of course not one member of this maddening crowd wanted to read or believe that they could be false, but one had to remain objective otherwise, they would be accused of falling back into the dark ages when people believed in magic. On top of that, everyone knew that not all of the cases were authentic. Some of them were psychotics, wishful thinkers and attention seekers laying their claims, However, it was good to sort the chaff from the wheat for it gave them respect among the scientific communities unlike the ancient folklore and mysticisms. These were not miracles or magic from antiquity, this was reality right here, right now. The literature was more diverse rather than adverse like the above-mentioned categories, there were many subheadings. Javier pretended to take a real interest as he read one of the pinups. Mary and Philip Harans were on an old dirt road north of Catonia when they saw what appeared to be a strange cylindrical aircraft in the night sky. 
It followed them for a while, and then the engine in their car, cut out as the UFO approached, and began hovering above them. They were confused at what to do, and the only thought that was in their minds was of escape, although they did not attempt it for they were paralyzed with fear. The next thing that they knew they were driving down the main junction that led to the freeway that would take them into Catonia, when they looked at their car clock, two and a half hours had mysteriously passed. Although they were puzzled and in a state of shock, they made a pact of secrecy so as not to become victims of ridicule. However, Mary began having horrific dreams of being abducted by aliens and Philip began having severe anxiety attacks while at home and at work, which led to acrophobia. The family doctor prescribed pills for Philip and referred Mary to a local psychologist. Phil was able to go back to work, although he had to work in the stores instead of on the deliveries in his work van, for although the drugs had annihilated his illness, he was too doped up to drive. Mary was hypnotized by her psychologist, so he could lift her out of the torment of her horrific nightmares. The psychologist's main aim was to either get to the root cause of her dreams of which he believed to be nothing other than a symbolic representation of a birth trauma, and then once there to take her stage by stage through the birth process guiding and comforting her until her birth. Or if the birth was to be too horrific, he was going to metaprogram her mind by rewriting the script while she was under, giving her a totally stress-free birth in its place. In his mind's eye, either action would obliterate her problem. As she went under she began to relive the traumatic experiences of that fearful night, and although she had some typical symbolic substance that could be easily associated with a birth trauma. The whole experience was so lifelike that it not only shocked him, but also placed doubt into the psychologist's mind of whether or not the experience was authentic. Being quite open-minded in his outlook he decided to treat it as though it was a real abduction, and if not, if he let her run through the event, he would reach the same outcome that psychologists reach when dealing with traumatic experiences that were believed to be the residue from past lives. Let them relive it and let the patient believe it and somehow the patient's problems would dissolve, leaving the mind forever free of the torment. He soon came to the understanding that her husband had somehow shared the event, or the delusion, and that they had both objectified the event by their joint observation of the lapse time, which made the case even more interesting. When Mary was brought to, Frank the psychologist asked about her husband and if it was true that they had set a code of silence to escape humiliation of which she shyly affirmed. A shared hallucination is one thing, but a secret pact to hide their joint delusion is totally out of character in these kinds of scenarios. So, it was that Frank asked to see Philip separately so as he could listen to his account and deduce what to make of it and where to go next. Frank had Mary's experience on tape, and he filed it under Mary and Philip Harans. When her husband was under hypnosis, Frank was very careful not to mention anything that Mary had said so as not to auto-suggest cryptonesia, or a fictitious account. Frank taped him while he was reliving that night's experience, one, because it was useful for later reference and two, so he could check the details of both the stories independently and simultaneously. Philip's account of that fearful night was as clear-cut as Mary's, only that it was seen and lived through his eyes. The UFO had landed next to them in a field at the side of the road and had immobilized them with some kind of technology. They were taken into the craft of which they gave a detailed description. They were then laid on of what appeared to be some kind of operating tables and exposed to experimentation. They were prodded and probed, scanned and experimented on and even a sample of blood, urine, his semen, an egg from Mary's uterus and saliva and skin tissue was taken from them. They were then hypnotized to forget the whole incident and were told to resume their journey in their car as if nothing had happened. Frank played both of the tapes to Mary and Phil and they were both overcome and overwhelmed with the accounts. After that, 
Frank gave them both several sessions of counseling and although they never really forgot the experiences of that night, they were able, with the help of Frank, to put it down as a one-off lifetime event and eventually, they were able to get on with their normal lives once more. However, before they did, their experience was written in a notorious UFO book, which then ended up on primetime television on a weird, but true daytime talk show, which subsequently led to a film being made of their experience. Although it was only loosely based on the true facts, everybody made a lot of money. Eventually, all the fuss died down and Mary got back to being a normal housewife, and Phil was able to stop administering his medication and get back to his original job as a deliveryman. Javier read another account of a farmer who claimed to have been used as a sex slave to impregnate an alien female during her short visit to our world before venturing back to her homeland into the stars. He was accosted by a group of aliens, carried aboard their vessel that was shaped like a disc and then his clothes were removed. He was then placed into a room whereupon the alien female entered and they made love. She gestured that he was a donor and she pointed up into the air, which he took as her meaning the stars. He was then given back his clothes and to his surprise and delight, he was allowed to go free. He acquired some sores from the experience that eventually faded with the help of some cream and medication from his general practitioner. However, his story did not end there for photos of his sores and the results of the doctor's swap tests were sent on for further inspection. He again rose to fame, because of his strange, but true endeavor, he made the local and national papers. His story eventually lost its popularity, as another replaced it, and he was able to get on with his normal life. There were endless names of people, who had had abduction experiences, and a lot of them were repeated experiences. Below them there was an encyclopedic array of computer CDs and books where one could reference and cross-reference the above names and accounts to give them weight and credence. One was even able to open up a world map with all the locations of the abduction sites, and for a small fee, one could receive a printout of all the above. A smile broke out on Javier's face when he read on another heading on the billboard that they are here among us. It went on that some 40 years ago some astronomers spotted a strange cluster of asteroids approaching the solar system, and that it was soon discovered that these asteroids were in coordination and heading directly for the planet. They eventually orbited the planet just out of range of the naked eye. It was then that another group of aliens came down and tried to negotiate with the world's leaders with a technological interplanetary deal, but to no avail. They simply stated that they were not the same as the other aliens in orbit and that they wished to share their technology, however, before they did they demanded world peace, social world equilibrium and all the weapons of mass destruction to be outlawed on the planet. The response of the world's leaders was negative, as they proclaimed that if they did as they asked with their weapons, that they would be vulnerable and defenseless, and as for the other two demands. I do not think they wanted to give away their birth rights, or their self-motivated ascendance to wealth and power to the lesser members of their planet. The aliens then told them, that the aliens that are in orbit around your world have destroyed their own world with a similar scenario, as your own goals will eventually do if taken to the limit. Further, they had nearly wiped themselves out of existence with a genetic disease, and that their technology was obviously greater than that of your world, but was inferior to theirs. They asked one more time with their plea, and were denied and so the aliens left the world's leaders in negotiation with the other aliens in orbit. The other aliens shared some of their technology, and in turn, they were allowed to take up residence in secret secluded areas on the planet, and on top of that, they were allowed to abduct animals to carry out genetic experiments and research so they could end their inevitable extinction. 
It then gave an account of the given alien technology, and went on to say that once they had landed and settled in that they began abducting people in their sleep. As well as when they were awake and fully conscious, and then after the experimentation hypnotizing them and placing them back, as if nothing had happened. Because of the might of the alien technology, it had been suppressed and outrightly denied until recently. Apparently, the aliens have a stronghold over the world powers, and even though they do not agree with their misconduct and misuse of their superior power, they are at an end on what to do, or how to deal with the ongoing situation. So, it is then that the aliens are the true dominant species of the planet. Through films, TV and the media, the governments are trying to soften the blow and supersede the subsequent panic. When the truth is eventually exposed or unveiled by changing the current view on aliens from would-be aggressors and out-and-out -out invaders, to diplomatic higher beings here to help us evolve with their technology and wisdom. The board showed artistic sketches and paintings of the different kind of aliens that have been seen by the onlookers or abductees. There were robot aliens, fetal aliens, furry animal aliens, humanoid aliens, lizard and fish-like aliens, ethereal aliens, insectoid aliens, and even intelligent cloud-like aliens. All were bipedal except for the latter. Javier again, had to suppress his smile of amusement at the array of pictures and postures. He then began to read how ancient cultures had written accounts of alien sightings, abductions, and tales of social or spiritual integration. There were numerous accounts within common folklore, mythology and theology of alien sightings and intervention. Flaming chariots had descended from the heavens taking maidens, as there would be brides, so they could crossbreed and spawn intergalactic children. Others were said to be taken aboard the chariots, and then up into the sky, and when they came back they shared strange wisdom, some were never to be seen again. Other ancient cultures spoke of a domesticating and nurturing process, as the aliens helped them with the development of their agricultural skills. Others suggested that DNA, or RNA, had arrived on meteors, which were the catalyst for our primordial origins, and that the nuclear age had created intergalactic awareness, and the subsequent arrival of alien intervention. He then gazed around at the crowd once more and this time, it was out and out ordered chaos. Before he walked away, he gave a glance at the board again for something else had caught his eye. What had caught his eye was the heading of, Who are the men in black? Beneath there was a number of accounts of people, who were said to have been cautioned by these so-called men in black to keep quiet about their alien abductions and sightings. They were threatened by these mysterious beings that if they did publicize their claims that they would not enjoy the consequences of their actions. The article said that no one knew if they were extraterrestrials, metaterrestrials, or working for the world governments. It also stated that the threats were never carried out no matter how convincing they seemed when they were mouthed. It stated that if anyone had suppressed their tales, or had heard of anyone that had suppressed their tales, that they should contact the address and telephone number at the bottom of the clipping. At that Javier took down the number and address, which he placed in his little black pocket book that he acquired from the back pocket of his jeans. He then made his way through the crowd until he reached the table that he had spotted earlier. He picked up several of the artifacts that were put on show on the table. A sign on the table stated that you can touch, but please do not be so selfish as to keep the alien artifacts. It went on to say that it was bad enough that the governments tried to keep the truth at bay, let alone the UFO students. He then picked up the artifact that he desired. It was made of a strange metal and was said to have not originated from this world, as did all the other artifacts on the table too. 
He swiftly put it in his pocket then made his way to the exit, however, before he did he made sure that he bought a few posters before he made his escape on the way out. Unknown to him, he had been spotted by two female budding enthusiasts, and they were making their way to the security guards as he exited the door. He made his way around the back of the tent facing the beach, and it was then that a sound filled the air, stop thief. Four security guards rounded the corner, two on each side ready to accost him. As they came into view, they were just in time to see Javier create a rift in space and a bright light shone out of it. Although the light was bright, it did not hurt the naked eye. It was then that Javier's attire was transformed into a black tailor-made suit, and covering his eyes were a pair of what looked like designer sunglasses. His skin had an ethereal quality, as he stepped into the rift, and it sealed shut after him ending with a bright flash, like the flash on a camera in the dark, only it was not dark. The security guards and the two girls just stared at the now empty space between them, not knowing what to say or do.